Henry, I spent my early career very much concerned with how brains function. And I was a neurophysiologist uh, looking at uh, electrical activity in the cerebral cortex and how it correlates with different forms of other parts of the brain, behaviors, etc. You've come at brain function as a physicist and as a quantum physicist. I want to understand how that can help me understand the brain. Well, the um, quantum physics gives you a different understanding of what's going on in the brain and what the brain is actually doing. And um, the important part is that the physical understanding that uh, you deal with, if you actually look at it from a quantum mechanical point of view, is only determining potentialities for things to happen. And the quantum mechanics requires another process beyond that, which Bohr calls the choice on the part of the experimenter as to what he's going to do. And um, so quantum mechanics really demands for its impl implementation and for its, um, uh, in order to allow it to make any predictions, two processes that are interrelated by actual events. And the actual events in quantum mechanics have two aspects, a psychological aspect as well as a physical aspect. And the psychological choice is something that's not described by the, by the physiological processes. It is influenced, you know, there is some input into the psychological process by the physiological process. I'm not saying that they're independent, but you cannot uh, follow through by using the quantum mechanical laws of motion uh, in order to understand how this choice of, of which question to ask is, um, is answered. So, so you see quantum mechanics affecting the brain as a whole, not just small individual Oh, absolutely. The, at, at, at the lowest level, you have these ion channels, and calcium ions flow through ion channels. In each neuron at the synapse between neurons mm -hmm. to create the electrical activity, uh, there are you know, untold numbers of, of, uh, of uh, these channels that allow various ions to go back and forth that create these electrical That's sparks. Right. So if you look at it in this, at this microscopic level, down there at the level of the individual calcium ions that are flowing in and out, and, uh, um, you absolutely need quantum mechanics, and the, the effect of the quantum mechanics is to kind of undo or blur the deterministic laws. There are certain uncertainties, and uh, therefore, um, you have you inject uncertainty at the microscopic level into the functioning of the brain, and then this, by virtue of the nonlinear property and the energy that's available, you get a, an explosion, and uh, you of finally get the entire brain of, of yeah of what yeah instead of uh, in a classical model the brain the whole brain because of the uh, deterministic laws that start at the lowest level and just work on up without any loss of um, uh, precision uh, lead you to one brain and um, a one brain structure. And uh, whereas uh, the quantum mechanical evolution of the brain, according to the quantum analogs of those same equations, gives you a, possible, uh, a range of possibilities. For example, something jumps out you're walking through the forest and a shadowy form <coughs> jumps out of the uh, darkness. And you have to decide fight or flight. And uh, in a quantum mechanical description, both of these possibilities could be present at some stage of the processing. There is a quantum superposition or mixture of the different possibilities. And uh, um, on the other hand, only one thing happens. And the way quantum mechanics resolves this is a certain particular question has to be posed, something coming outside 
of this evolution of the potentialities, which um, uh, uh, says that the wave function will either collapse to one form or to the yes answer to this question, to one pattern of neurological activity, or it will collapse to an, uh, something that excludes that particular. So these, these discrete choices are coming in, and they're not described by the physical laws that uh, uh, are the generalization of the laws of classical mechanics. But if, if quantum mechanics has that much of an impact on, on this macroscopic brain yes. function, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can that happen? Because everything I know about quantum mechanics says that it, it can only occur in very uh, isolated conditions and very cold states, and then the brain is a hot, warm entity. And uh, wouldn't wouldn't the 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 uh, connection be the, these quantum states and this hot, warm brain immediately collapse all these waves and just disappear? It doesn't collapse the waves to uh, any particular. There, the fact that it's warm and interacting with the environment, and uh, there's, uh, there are processes that tend to make it decohere, is the usual. So you don't have a, an actual superposition of these different possibilities, but you have what is called a mixture of them. So they're still there. They're not interfering with each other, but they're all present. And so uh, you still have to make a choice between all of these possibilities. There's not an automatic reduction. All the hotness and the warmness and the interaction with the environment does not reduce it to a particular state. You still have the range of possibilities, and therefore you need this question to be posed in order for quantum mechanics to work and pull out a distinct answer. This warm environmental uh, uh, interaction, what, what does that do to the quantum? Doesn't it disturb something in the decoherence? Um, it, 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 it destroys the interference phenomenon. In quantum mechanics, you have a, a big distinction of what's called a superposition and a mixture. Now, it's a bit of a technical thing, but in a mixture, the different possibilities are not uh, related in such a way that you can form an interference. In, uh, okay. So you're saying there's no interference, but there still is the mixture. That's right. And that is sufficient to make a, a substantial uh, yeah, yeah, you ha yeah, you have to get rid of this mixture and you have to knock it down to some particular thing because it's a whole range or smear of possibilities. So in order to make quantum mechanics work, you need to have this other process that poses the question. And uh, it doesn't come out of the laws that are the analogs of the laws of classical mechanics. Which is the way typical neuroscientists yeah, do their business. Typical neuroscientists assume that the laws of classical mechanics basically hold, or at least that conception of how things work, is what, is, what they assume. So you believe that, that we'll never understand brain function unless we include within it a quantum mechanical uh, understanding of the entire brain? Um, absolutely, because these choices have an effect. I mean, if it was just a matter of a description of something that's happening up there, uh, you could say, well, you can, maybe you could understand it classically. But these choices have an effect on what happens in the brain. And uh, therefore, uh, it means you've got to go, in order to account for an effect like this, you've got to go beyond the analog, the quantum analog of the, of the classical equations of motion. What about the Libet experiments, which seem to show that when we want to raise our thumb or some action, that there's an evoked potential in electrical activity in our brain prior to having this experience, this, this sense of wanting to do it, which would seem to be demonstration that the brain physical activity comes first and the psychological process is just a secondary derivative of the physical world. Yeah, the Libet experiment, you know, is the person is told maybe in the next minute to raise his thumb at some time that he chooses. Right. And what you find is that there's this evoked potential, some activity in the brain that happens before he actually raises his thumb and... Uh, and, um, and has the conscious sense of wanting to. And, and has the conscious sense of wanting to raise it. Or, or, and uh, so according to um, William James, this... This conscious choice of being able to choose this or that 
uh, comes only after the brain has generated the, the notion of the possible action that it's going to do. It throws out the idea of, I can raise my thumb now. And according to James, and according to Libet, and according to quantum mechanics, that potentiality to do this thing is not automatic. There's a, a choice that's allowed by quantum mechanics, and uh, William James says it occurs in his understanding of what's going on in the brain, is a choice to consent or not consent to that action. And it's a, and this, it's this, this last um, thing where you're conscious of making the choice of doing it or not doing it. And that occurs after the pulse. But the pulse was needed in order to generate the idea that you're judging. So, so what you're saying, I think, is that the, the brain activity comes first that generates a range of possibilities. Well, this particular, in this particular case, it's... Um, okay, there's... But let's say that what you observe experimentally is, is a particular time that it looks like this, I mean, this pulse comes through at a particular time before you are aware of the fact that you want to raise your thumb. Right. And uh, it's only later that uh, you're aware of choosing to raise your thumb. Right. And uh, according to this quantum mechanical model, though, the first pulse has to do with the creation of the idea of possibly doing this. Now, is, then, that in, in the, is that a psychological process, yeah. or is that in the brain? The brain, there's this, each, the, the quantum mechanical, there are these events, and each has a psychological and a physical aspect. Okay. And uh, so what happens in the brain uh, uh, leads to an event which has a psychological counterpart. So this event happens in the brain, and there's an event that puts up into the brain the idea raise my thumb now. But there is then the, the choice has to be made. In fact, that's what William James says, that before it actually happens, there has to be a, a, a consent to do it. And, and that's that how, consent is the independent psychological process. That, that is the thing that's basically under the control of what you th would say is the psychological process. Independent of what the brain is doing, um, or separate well, from the brain. Well, of course, it's judging something that the brain has just put out, so it's not totally independent of what the brain has done. But the choice to do or yes. not to do yes. is is not determined by the possibility of doing it. The possibility of doing it is generated by the brain, but then the choice of whether or not to do it is not determined by the uh, by the brain process alone. In other words, it requires a psychological input.